Our values and beliefs drive our decision-making, actions, and behavior. What we say, what we do, how we behave can be directly linked to what we value and believe. But what if? What if what we value and believe, or what mattered to us the most, was either lost, stolen, withheld from us, or even destroyed? That is what happened to my sister and brothers and me on the morning of July 2nd, 1984, just days away from our 35th anniversary. Home alone, I woke up to my mother, Jacqueline, screaming. I slowly rose from my bed and looked out of our living room window and saw mom, Jacqueline's ex-boyfriend, dragging her and my 12-year-old brother down the street toward our home. I didn't think much of it. We had lived under his terror for months, so I went to find something to eat. Eventually, my mom banged on the door and, op and I opened it. She ran toward the window, screaming to the neighbors for help, call the police. My brother stood against the wall with one foot glued to the floor and one against the wall. Mom's ex-boyfriend took out a black gun and loaded it, bullet by bullet. He wasted no time. He walked over to my mom. She frantically turned to him. He pointed the gun to her face and she yelled as loud as she could yell, no, he pulled the trigger. He then went to my brother, Tony, put the gun up to his head and pulled the trigger. He then walked over to me and squatted with the gun to my head in front of me. I looked down the barrel and into his eyes and I begged, fast as I can, please don't kill me, I'll do anything. He didn't respond, so I looked up to the ceiling, held my hands tightly and begged, God, please don't let him kill me, I will do anything. An eternity had passed. He pulled the gun back, stood and walked to the other side of the room. After pacing, he, that, he said that I could leave, but where was I going? This was our family living room. With my little shorts on and no shoes, I slowly rose from my seat and put one foot after another through the threshold of our door. After getting further away from our home, I ran as fast as I could, screaming my mom's words, call the police. A three-hour standoff, two murders, one suicide. We never returned to that rental home in Capitol Heights, Maryland again. A loving family member trying to make sense of it all patted me on my shoulder and told me before the funeral, baby, you're going to have to forget about it. My grandmother packed what photos she had, locked them in a black and gold chest, and we all tried to forget. I took that strategy to the fifth grade, trying to imagine a world much different than what I had experienced. Three years later in seventh grade, I could not bear the pain anymore. I woke up one morning and I put my book bag on and headed off to school. I stood on our neighborhood bridge on North Capitol Street, just 22 blocks away from my seat today, having decided to take William Kellebrew, me, out of the equation. I had lost every piece of dignity I had as a child. My voice, my soul, and my purpose, empty. I was one decision away from relief, but I made it to school. My assistant principal, Mr. Charles C. Christian, called my grandmother and I was hospitalized for 30 days. When I was discharged, I met my first ever therapist, Christine Pierre. Instead of having the session in her office, she took me to the cafeteria at Children's Hospital and asked me, what do you want for lunch? On a one-to-one, -one, I said to myself, I'm gonna clean you out. I started at the ice cream machine and I must have built the biggest ice cream cone you can build on this side of Earth. No adult had ever listened so intently to what I had to say. It was the beginning of my healing journey and my first introduction to the mental health system. 30 years later, I sit here reminded of the long journey of hope, healing, and resilience. I stand today alongside my fellow survivors with a sense of purpose, dignity, and respect for the shoulders I stand on and a sense that healing is absolutely possible. Two professors from my university, the University of the District of Columbia, where I earned my first degree, started the William Calibre Foundation in 2008. They recognized my passion for service and invested in supporting victims of crime and my career as a victim and survivor advocate. Today, I have taken my passion to my role as a director for the Office of Youth and Trauma Services at the Baltimore City Health Department, where my mom was born in the 50s. I am afforded the opportunity to work alongside brilliant and dedicated colleagues and under the leadership of the city's health commissioner, Dr. Leticia Jaraza to continue to build a trauma-informed and responsive city at the forefront of a national violence, trauma, opioid, and substance use epidemic claiming precious lives each day. We have trained over 3,100 city employees, community members, small businesses, and nonprofits in a trauma-informed approach, and now we're working to ensure a longer-term impact with solid metrics in, in place. 
The journey for me, like so many children, young African-American males and families I engage in Baltimore and DC and across the country is not an easy journey of recovery. My grandmother who is sitting here today said to me as a little boy, if you can handle your mom and brother's death, you can handle anything. I didn't know what she meant by that age, by, by that at age 10 or 21, but I held on to her faith because I did not have much growing up. I had hoped that she knew what she was talking about. When I first started my job in Baltimore, I met a young boy around the age of seven who had been shot in his head. He was playing in his neighborhood as nothing had happened. He told me his story, but what I took away was that while lying in the hospital fighting for his life, he said that he was trying to stay alive for his family. Families cannot be, be left to grapple with the aftermath of trauma. We need sound support through leadership and governance, effective policies and practices, mental health and substance use supports and treatments, a knowledge base in addressing trauma, and the caring and compassion that I know we are all capable of delivering that can reduce the stigma of experiencing trauma, mental health, and substance use challenges. Trauma can strip us of our values, our voice, and our dignity. Trauma can be dehumanizing, but our role as survivors, as human beings, is to bring humanity back into its space. That is what the United States Congress has done today. Thank you to the Honorable Congressman Elijah Cummings and to uh, the Honorable Congressional colleagues and staff of the Committee on Oversight and Reform. And I've always wanted to say this. I yield my time, my time to my grandmother who worked on her job for 38 years, was late less than 10 times, and never used an alarm clock with a singular mission, to give our family a chance at life. Please just stand and be recognized to my grandmother behind me. Will you stand, please? Please stand up. Thank you. Thank you for your statement, and thank you for recognizing that beautiful lady that just stood up. Thank you. And thank you for being here.